We've got flags and banners, and if you mind your manners, we might even get to standards and what they represent. So just take my boy's hand, and we'll both try to understand how this vexillion logic podcast could be flagged for content. Flagged for content. What's up, Vexheads, and welcome to episode. 61 part one of flagged for content it's the only podcast that's ever done a part one and a part two that's right it's a new invention uh and speaking of that the reason we're doing a part one and part two this week is because brian cham and i had a lot to talk about so we went on for quite a long time i am splitting it up into two episodes basically for time reasons uh, so that you can have more easily digestible bites of this conversation. Anyway, so this is part one of that episode. Or well, part two will come out later this week, so you don't have too long to wait in between. Um, but there were some issues where I had to clean up audio, this, that, and the other. So it was a little bit of a labor of love on this one. Anyway, um, I am sorry for the delay. This is also, yeah, I did want to mention... This one is going to be a very visual episode because Brian brought a like PowerPoint with him, basically. Um, and so we go through a lot of that. Uh, again, it's very visual where you can see like the timeline of where things happened, um, see what several different options were when they narrowed it to a final six and three, etc. cetera. Um, so for listeners, that stuff will be in the show notes. Wouldn't be the worst idea to kind of follow along there uh, if possible. I know if you're driving, that's pretty hard. But um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I do apologize that there are more ads than usual. Uh, well, there are three ad breaks, basically. And uh, I guess on that same note, I should shout out the Patreon. You can come support us over at patreon.com slash flagged for content and get ad free episodes, bonus episodes and bonus bonus episodes. Uh, so that's fun. Anyway, I don't want to go into too much more since, again, I'm already having to split this up due to length. But I do apologize again for the delay. I was at Nava meeting Brian Cham in person, hanging out, talking with him and Andrew Precker, who was the designer of the original version of this flag. I have a signed copy up here behind me, if you can see it, uh, if you're watching on YouTube. And I also had to wait for Brian to get out of an NDA or uh, an embargo, I think he calls it anyway. Uh, so all that said, all that aside, let's go ahead and get into part one of episode 61 of Flagged for Content. Here we go. Folks, we have an absolute all-star of the vexillology and vexillography world with us this week. You know him from the Flag Design Forum. You know him from the Utah and Minnesota redesign processes. And you know him as the author of Six Deal Breakers of Bad Flag Design. It's Brian Cham! Hi, Andy. And hi, Big Sid. It's great to be here. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's so great to have you. How's it uh, how's it going in your part of the world? It is hot. It is uh, hot. <laughs> it is. It, we're still in summer, and we don't have air conditioning here. Right, right. And uh, despite so, you are from New Zealand, but you're located in the UK. That's right. London, yes. London, yeah. Oh God. So I imagine London is very hot because at least I remember like summers in New York and Boston. It's like a concrete like jungle where the heat just swells up off the street. Yeah, it feels like that here as well. I imagine very similar. Yeah, is it? How long have you been in London versus uh, how long were, uh, you lived in New Zealand? Uh, I've been in London for almost two years, and I was in Auckland for the previous portion of my life. Is it weird going from like you know, summer in the southern hemisphere to southern in the northern? <laughs> like, I guess you get used. Actually, to Actually, uh, when I moved over, it was just at the end of winter in New Zealand. So I oh. came here to London, and then I experienced another winter just after that. <laughs> so yeah, it's eternal winter. It's like uh, Game of Thrones type stuff. <laughs> so we have like so much to get into today that we don't have time for any more weather talk, which I know the listeners and viewers will be sad about. But uh, 
we've got to get to what is sure. on the flagpole today here with Brian. So as always, we will get into an overrated flag and an underrated flag uh, in Brian's oh. view. Wow. We will get an in-depth look into the Minnesota Commission's redesign effort now that Brian is kind of free from any embargoes on like talking about it. Uh, we'll go over his famous six deal breakers as I try not to make too many 30 Rock jokes. And we've got some questions from you, the viewers and listeners, to round it all off. But first, Brian, before we get to any of that stuff, I like to ask my guest, what is your favorite flag? Let me show you. Oh, all right. My favorite flag is that of Canada. It, right on. Classic. Uh, 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 very much. Very simple. It's effective. Um, very, very iconic, even from far away. Mm -hmm. um, nice balance and symmetry as well. Yeah, yeah. Invented the Canadian pale, as far as I know, and as far as the, you know, the name and assumes. It, and it's, it's the Canadian pale is well suited for framing the maple leaf in the center. Yeah, it really Washington is. very harmonious. It is. It's perfect for that. I think, like, if I remember, uh, I think that was Ted Kay's favorite when he was on the show as well. Ah, um, great minds think alike. Yeah, right? <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> so you're, you're in good company there. So, yeah, so what specifically about the Canadian flag that we, uh, other than what we just kind of went over? Oh, boy. Uh, well, other than that, I think the color scheme is quite striking. If I show you my full display of flags. Oh, totally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, oh, is it Toronto? It does, yeah. It's a, it does, yeah. Oh, very good. Um, even, yeah, it took, took Ted a while to get that one, so uh, congratulations for getting that instantly. Hey. Um, Canada stands out quite well very distinct uh, red and white and the maple leaf shows up in pretty much any orientation even when it's just hanging like this it just right, stands right out yeah from any collection yeah true yeah and like uh like ted said like um yeah the two simple colors like red and white the central element um i think he and i talked a lot on the flags of canada and japan which obviously central red element on white. Uh, of course, Canada has the Canadian pale, like the red on the uh, hoist and fly side that, that Japan's doesn't. But other than that, fairly similar. And as you said, very striking, very noticeable at a distance. And yeah, I mean, I, even looking at them behind you, I guess I never really thought of it in those exact terms, but you, yeah, it does not get lost in a crowd. That much is for sure. And Ted's main thing is... Uh, signaling at a distance i guess is is uh, definitely one of his main things and it does that it has that in spades uh as they say so definitely right, yeah. signals a lot when i was there and the rendition of the maple leaf specifically um it's quite simple uh smooth edges and quite a blocky interior and that helps it to be very um, distinctive at a distance and they actually developed that through several design iterations uh, by testing different uh, maple leaf designs in a wind tunnel. And that's how they developed this uh, specific rendition rather than a, a more realistic or more detailed rendition. Okay, I did not know that. Wait, in a wind tunnel, what do you mean? Uh, I, I believe I'm gonna, they used the same yeah. sort of wind tunnel that they used for testing aircraft. And then... Right, I guess I get the concept. Wind. I just don't understand how it would apply to graphic design. Because you'd want the maple leaf to be uh, visible or recognizable um, at a distance, even when it's waving and moving. When it's a very detailed design, uh, the overall shape or the outline is not as distinguishable. Once you simplify it okay, and smooth all right. the edges then you can always tell from any sort of orientation that it's that particular simple maple leaf design. Right. Okay, I gotcha. That was, uh, that was just me playing, playing a dumb guy uh, so that the audience gets, you know, a little bit more information. <laughs> no, that is awesome. I was going to ask uh, what you thought about some of the earlier maple leaf designs, like the uh, Pearson pennant and... Uh, uh, I think that's the one with like three maple leaves, right? Three maple leaves. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So there were three of them. One of them represented the British. The second one represented the French, and the third one represented the 
um, Aboriginal people. Right. Um, it's a nice sentiment, but as Ted says, it's usually better to have one symbol that represents everyone. That way you don't have to go into the nitty gritty details of whether you've included every group that you need to. Right. And it's simpler yeah. graphically. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it's definitely simple. Yeah, for sure, graphically. And um, I think I like the just two colors, the red and white, more than the uh, blue on the fly and hoist, too. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, not much debate about the Canadian flag. I mean, two of the utmost experts have come on and tell, told me it's their favorite flag. So I think I should take that pretty much as canon. So uh, if you're good to move on, we can go to either your overrated or underrated flag first, uh, whichever order you prefer. Sure. Well, I think a very underrated flag is the flag of Switzerland. I don't oh. have an example here to show you, but I think everyone knows what that looks like. Yeah. And that's part of how iconic that equilateral cross on a red background is. Because mm -hmm. not only does it uh, not only does it appear on the flag, but you can also see it on other Swiss products. Um, right. And when you see it, even at a distance, it is instantly recognizable. It's got that simplistic shape, even just like the maple leaf of Canada. It's got, you know, smooth edges, very simple, blocky sort of interior. And I can tell you, this is a bit anecdotal, but uh, there is a lot of air traffic in London. Lots of planes go back and forth. Sometimes, um, sometimes I just like to watch the planes. I can always tell when a plane is Swiss Air, mm. even when it's flying several miles away. Right. Many miles away. Because even when it's a tiny little sort of tic tac size thing on the horizon, you yeah, can still yeah. see the red with the cross. Right. And that shows just how iconic the Swiss flag is. Not only as a flag, but as a general, uh, I guess you could call it a, a brand identity. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, and, and like, as you mentioned, you can definitely wrap that in with the Canadian maple leaf. Like all you need to see on like a jar of syrup, say, is a maple leaf, and you know that's a yeah. product of Canada. Uh, yeah, like um, uh, what's the brand? I'm trying to think of. Uh, well, obviously on every Swiss Army knife, it's got that. Yes, Swiss Army knife. You um, thinking of Toblerones? I wasn't. I was thinking of Swiss Gear, but also that one. Oh. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of like a lot of brands that rely very heavily on that symbol. And yeah, it's more than like, I mean, obviously, if you see anything with a, say, even a circular version of like the stars and stripes, like the US flag, like, okay, you know, that's made in America or whatever. But, mm -hmm. but that's like putting a flag in a circle. This is like this and the Canada one is like just taking the central element mm -hmm. and just slapping it on there. And you automatically know from the element alone which you don't with most things exactly. so yeah it's yeah. one single element even if you were to remove the colors and put it in monochrome which i have also seen the mm -hmm. canadian maple leaf with a swiss uh swiss cross purely in black and white on a monochrome context you can still see it instantly yeah yeah i never really thought about uh flags as well i mean i have thought about flags as symbols obviously but those are probably two among two of the better better or best ones uh I'm trying to think of other ones now because yeah a lot of the other ones you can't put in monochrome like tri-bends like or tri-bands and uh and tri-colors uh you know you no, have... they just get lost out because they just become rectangles exactly i mean you can it's do the, the union flag yeah i've seen that as well there's and a bit of detail in it but sometimes gets lost as far as the uh the saltier parts but yeah yeah, I've seen the Union Jack incorporated into a lot of like British logos. And even then, even when you only see right. the part of it, or very distorted version of it, you can still recognize it quite, quite yeah, immediately. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's a good one as well. It. Yeah, yeah, but I can't the think. Of... British Space Agency has the logo, uh, which is very um, reminiscent of the Union Jack, but it's only like a tiny portion of it, and it just forms like an arrow, I believe. Are you looking that up? Oh, you heard me typing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, wow. That actually, that does look pretty cool. I do dig that logo. Yeah. UK Space Agency. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is another iconic one. But it's still like, you know, a variation on it. Whereas the Swiss and Canadian ones are just like, it's that. You just smack it in exactly. the middle there. Yeah. And if it didn't have the unfortunate World War II connotations, like the older Japanese, like uh, naval flag would 
would probably fit that. I'm just trying to like reach out and think in the back of my brain of like other ones that could or could have uh, had kind of that deal too. But yeah, drawing a blank for now. I'll probably think of one halfway through like block two of this and just spout it out for no reason. But um, <laughs> that's how my brain works. Um, all right. So I think we have got... Um, there's some people that are going to be a little less than happy with your overrated <laughs> one. I myself am fairly happy with it. And there's a few listeners that already know what it is just from me saying kind of that dichotomy alone there. But uh, mm. let's go ahead and get into our overrated flag. Well, well your overrated flag. <laughs> I think one of the most overrated flags is that of Maryland. Oh, no. Say it ain't so. <laughs> I know, it's beloved by so many people and so many vexillologists uh, yes. in our 2004 uh, state and uh, provincial flag survey. It came within the top 10 state flags in America. Mm -hmm. I think it's complete shit, I'll say. Uh -huh. I, yeah. I am not generally a fan of counter-changing, but I can accept it when it's done in a limited amount and for a good aesthetic reason. <laughs> Right, me too. Maryland just goes off the rails with it. Yep. It looks like, I mean, the the number of different, uh, you know, counter-changing panels on there, it really looks to me like the visual equivalent of a migraine. Of a what? A migraine. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I could understand that, no joke, like, yeah. It, like... It's Absolutely. literally got the, the, the flashing zigzags, zigzag pattern that you see when you get a migraine. Like if, if someone were to make a, you know, a flag for uh, a migraine sufferers association, yeah, yeah. they were to put like, yeah. those awful patterns on a flag, it would end up looking something like the flag of Maryland. It, yeah. Yeah, it it's absolutely just, would. It's just too many... Yeah, it's too much, uh, yeah, jagged, zigzag patterns just assaulting my eye, especially when it's waving. So I, I, I can't get behind that at all. I can't get behind it either. I, uh, and it is like, as, you know, as you and I and probably everyone who's bothering to watch this, listen to this, already knows, it is, I think, one of the more polarizing flags because people love it and people hate it there's not many people that are kind of just like in the middle on this one um you know hate is a strong word hate. yeah 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 i was gonna say i i think i'm pretty comfortable with the word hate on this one and we talk about it all the time in the discord soft plug for the discord if listeners and viewers want to get in there and uh tell me why i'm wrong or right about the maryland flag <laughs> among many other things then hop in but yeah um, it is a common topic because we have a few Marylanders in there who, and yeah, Marylanders, somebody even posted the meme the other day. I think it was, a uh, uh, Evan, one of our past guests posted a meme the other day that was like that, that guy standing in front of like the big water tube that's leaking. And then you slap like the seal, like flex seal thing on it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I know that one. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, uh, Marylanders with their flag, like, like on anything basically like oh is that a, a noun here's a maryland flag like, <laughs> slap it on it yeah they do love it but i i agree it's a visual assault to me like it was is how i've always explained it or like or described it um it's it's violence to my eyes it is it's violence to my eyes as well i can deal like you said with some quarter changing um some sometimes when done well and when not done like and you know more than me like are the crossland arms are they also considered quarter changed or counter changed sorry i keep saying that that would also be counter changed so but i also... think yeah i think if that if that cross quarter by itself were just the flag which um which has actually been talked about in a nava presentation last year by a very very enthusiastic marylander yes i think that would be an excellent flag and yeah, I would yeah. not call that an assault on my eyes or complete ship. But they've got everything on there, so I do have to call it. Same. Yeah, it's it's counterchanging on counterchanging, and I think that's the uh, the sin in my eyes uh, and at my eyes, as it were. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, um, I guess that probably wraps up part one here with the overrated, underrated, favorite, etc. So 
we have got a big part two to get into. So we will go ahead and take uh, somewhat of an early break here. And when we come back, more with Brian Cham and a lot more on the Minnesota Flag Commission. All right, and we are back, part two here, more with Brian Cham, as promised, and a lot more on the Minnesota flag design process. So, uh, Brian, yeah, you were the vexillologist on that committee, commission, whatever we're calling it, um, and you have got like an entire kind of presentation here for us. I am, and I'm sure the viewers and listeners are as well, very curious to see kind of what this process was like from start to finish. So, uh, you know, as I always say on the show, let's start from the start. Well, I've been waiting for a long time to talk about this. Um, I've, yeah. I've been on embargo for several months. Right. Um, but now I can finally talk about experiences uh, in the Minnesota mission. So uh, can you see this timeline? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, cool, uh, cool, cool. So this timeline is a general overview of how we were involved with the commission. So just to give a bit of context, I was part of a specific uh, sort of subgroup uh, composed of vexillologists and graphic designers who were there to give uh, expert advice and later on to directly work on the refinements to the finalist designs. Uh, I was part of the group, Ted K, well, uh, another pixologist, was part of there, part of that. Uh, Lewis Rich was the head of the commission and also a graphic designer. And Janae and Tyler Mikulitz, who were also graphic designers. Um, you'll see, uh, you'll also see the name Andrew Pricker on here. He was the yeah. original designer of the final Minnesota flag. Uh, he wasn't part of the group directly, but we were in contact with him uh, through emails. So he was still involved. Okay. And, and uh, I'd like to show you yeah, some of the slides in the presentation that we have prepared. So this is actually an extract from a presentation that we're going to give um, at NAVA 58 in St. Paul. There's, there'll be two presentations about the Minnesota flag design process from the inside. One will be the political side of the process uh, presented by Lewis Fitch, and the, other, and the other part will be the design part of the process, which will be uh, presented by the design group. So awesome. I'll start from the left-hand side of the slide. So SCRC, that State Emblems Redesign Commission, uh, me meetings and selections. So they they were working throughout the whole process on that. Uh, and then yeah, and then there's the public uh, design submission period where Andrew Fricker submitted his original design. Uh, while they were so evaluating those, there were some vexillology consultations uh, by Ted and myself. Uh, there was another person involved as well, um, a vexillologist named Lee Hero. He was very uh, instrumental in um, bringing about a Minnesota flag change. He has been campaigning for, he's a local in Minnesota, and he's been campaigning for, for that for many decades, uh, constantly uh, lobbying lawmakers for that change. So if he, he finally got to, to see his idea come to life. He was yeah. also involved in the um, design, the North Star flag design that was quite popular in Minnesota as probably as one of the earliest, or one possibly the earliest um, flag proposal for Minnesota. That was many years ago. Yeah, uh, he's, he's been on the show actually talking about really? that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, then you have his perspective. He wasn't on this... Um, on, on this particular design team itself, that he was also part of the consultations to the commission. Right. Um, then, well, this, this isn't really to scale, but um, there's a very long gap in the timeline uh, between initial vexillology consultations and then the advocacy presentations for finalists. So oh. there's a long time, long gap there, but at the point where uh, the SCRC had selected the six finalist designs, and they got uh, feedback, uh, some extra, I guess, symbolism and things like that from the original designers. Uh, Janae and Pyla got involved as graphic designers. Uh, they submitted uh, their feedback, um, 
and they were they started getting more and in, directly involved with the SERC and their meetings before before that uh, we were kind of uh, sort of on the sidelines so we were there as a resource if they wanted um, any advice or any feedback and they would and the commission would just ask us on you know a very sporadic basis uh, mm -hmm. to come and that's where the consultations came from like we you know well, mainly Ted, actually, at the beginning, like Ted spoke, and then you would sort of just on the sideline until they called him back. But it's at the point where, see, on the time submitted, final six report. After that, that's where we got really involved. Right, um, yeah. And there was a really deep collaboration there. And then you see the next part of the next phase of the timeline, finalist refinements. That's where my involvement was biggest. That's where we had the joint design sessions, and you see a... Uh, the names of the bottom, Janae, Tyler, Ted, B. Uh, Lewis Fitch, his name should also be there. He was also part of the joint design sessions. Um, so if anyone's been in the flag design forum with me, they'll know what that's like. Um, we discuss flag design process, uh, projects in process. Um, I, I bring them up as vector files on Inkscape, and whenever anyone has a suggestion of things we can uh, tweak, things we can combine, things to change, things to overhaul, then I... I preview that in Inkscape, I make that, and uh, I produce lots of different options for you to choose from. So we were going through those design sessions um, sort of virtually over Zoom. Uh, we're okay. doing this edits in real time. Uh, and then at the end of that process, we see pre presentations to SERC. So Janae and Tyler are locals in Minnesota, and they were actually in the room when uh, they made the final, final, final selection. And that and that was guided by a presentation, well, several presentations they gave in the room, showing the uh, showing the options that came out of the design session, showing the feedback right. from both fixologists and designers, and giving them a lot of guidance as well. And yeah, uh, then you see the final bit of that white part, uh, final design selected. So that's when the flag that's behind me got chosen as the final one, and then the last part is just report guidelines, which is just cleaning up some of the minor things like, uh, you know, the exact Pantone shades, the exact uh, portions, which we have already been discussing. And I think um, the, the biggest sort of thing to keep in mind is that uh, during that big gap in the middle, the sort of white section in the timeline, um, yeah. we as a subgroup were involved very sporadically that uh, it's only later on when we were making the refinements that our collaboration was more involved and we had the ability to um, express a lot of our thoughts and our feedback um, within the commission's discussions. Uh, before that, we was, there were sort of, yeah, we, we were treated as, as a resource and, you know, they might come to us and, and say like, oh, how would this design look if you change this degree? And we were just make it for them and then send it back to them. Uh, but okay, we wouldn't okay. have, have the ability to give our own input and right. and ask them, you know, uh, have you considered instead of changing it to green, why don't you change it to something else? Or here's my own suggestion for how that flag design should be um, should be changed. But during the, the final part, especially when Janae and Tyler were within the commission meetings, they had the ability to um, participate in the discussions and give uh, their own advice, give their own guidance um, as expert advisors and not just um, resources sort of on the sideline um, okay. to sort yeah. of engage with sporadically. So, and so uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, no, th th no, that's awesome. Like, thank you for walking us through the timeline. I actually like, that's one of the things that I, and I think a lot of people had the most questions on. And one of my questions, I know this isn't one of the ones that we kind of like previewed uh, talking about and everything, but I'm sure you have some insight on this. Um, so I know this is not the first and won't be the last. In fact, there's some ongoing ones uh, uh, that I can't really even talk about right now. Um, flag committees, commissions, whatever you want to call them going on. But is this kind of a standard timeline for such a thing? Or is there even such a thing as a standard timeline for something like this? Uh, Minnesota was not a very typical flag design process. It was very, um, it was very compacted. It, it okay. took only a few months for everything, including the um, 
right. design submissions. That's what uh, I was thinking. It seemed, yeah. yeah. There are a lot of things that we would have <laughs> loved to do, um, including yeah, more consultations, more involvement, things like that, if we had the time. But uh, we simply weren't able to do that. So we had to do, um, we had to get involved as best as we could. Uh, right. given the limitations of the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. You had to work within the mixed. constraints. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, every process is like that. It's ne you're never going to have every everything aligned perfectly. Um, but this, for the particular process, the main challenge uh, was time. I think that's also another reason why we got, um, why we were invited to be um, so directly uh, collaborative near the end, because before that, they actually held their meetings on a monthly basis. And it was during the, I believe the penultimate meeting where they realized that they're not, they may not have something in time. There's only like, you know, one or two meetings left. They still have a lot to discuss. They still have a lot of meet, uh, designs to whittle down. And, and that's also a, a reason why the commission was quite happy to um, have us work on the designs, work on the options, come in and give them um, some expert guidance and advice so that because they knew that they couldn't just, you know, uh, engage us once a month for the next five or six months because they just yeah. didn't have that much time. They really yeah, had to accelerate yeah. things and, and right. get everyone um, on the same page and committed to something final by the end okay. of the December meeting. Okay, yeah, yeah, I was just, just curious on the on that, especially because some of the upcoming ones may or may not involve me. So just wondering what I'm getting myself into, uh, allegedly. Uh, anyway, um, all right, yes, okay. So, yes, loving this timeline. Um, that, especially as a very visual learner, this, this definitely helps me out a lot, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers as well. Um, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm happy to, to keep going when you are. Right. Here, uh, here's something that I don't think anyone else has seen before. This is the first. Uh, Andrew Tricker uh, contributed this to the presentation. This oh. slide shows his final three designs that he submitted to the Minnesota Flag Design presentation. Each of these uh, was based on a similar idea, having a North Star somewhere near the hoist and the, the shape of the state and something to represent waters especially. They all expressed it, this idea in different ways. Now, what do you think of these three designs, Andrew? I, I don't know. I personally, I think I like the 1953 one the best um, out of these three designs. I, you know, I don't love the recent trend, which we talked about. We've we've talked about in our Discord a bit, and I've talked about with some people on Instagram of the green and blue. Like green is the land, blue is the water or the sky or whatever. Um, too much green and blue in our current slate of like flag redesigns kind of irks me. Which I I don't know. Like I will say, 1994. This third one here is my. Second favorite, very, very close second favorite to 53, I think. 1973 has a little bit too much going on for me, although I do like that the kind of teal uh, diagonal goes directly into one of the waves. I do like that as an element. Um, yeah, I think that would be my order, would be 53, and then a very, very, very close second, 94, and then 73. Um, yeah, because, I mean, yeah, like, like I just said about... Um, green and blue but then there's also the prevalence of red white and blue flags so mm, that's true you know there's a little bit of that and i, and I i've I mean, also been looking because again we've been chatting in discord and i've got it pulled up on my other screen here um uh precker actually went a lot onto our vexillology like the reddit uh subreddit for vexillology and got a lot of feedback from them and i'm seeing where he had several of his designs this 1994 one included uh kind of like graded by people on reddit and honed them accordingly uh right. to to the versions that i think we have here on our on our screen here so right. yeah it's just, uh, so just... i mean i i agree with the the ranking given i think 1953 is the best one 1994 the next one in 1973 um after that um 
Sounds like this might not be the first time that people, uh, people in the public have seen this, though. I, I was hoping to get a sort of exclusive look into his design process. Yeah, um, yeah, no. They're, they're, even the ones on Reddit are different. Like, the 1994 really? has a uh, has a white, like, fimbriation around the red uh, shape state thing. Like, yeah, they're different. This is this is definitely yeah. the first time I've seen 1973 and that version of 94. Okay, okay. Well, in that case, I think we agreed on the best selection here, so I'll move on. Uh, here yeah. are the six finalists that were chosen <clears throat> by the commission. And this is point where my involvement, as well as Ted, Tyler, Janae, as well, um, really kicked off. Um, it, was, it was just after this point. Uh, we were asked by the commission to identify um, the best of the finalists, and to try different refinements. They had specific uh, recommendations about what sort of things they wanted us to try, but they mm -hmm. were also happy to give us uh, free reign to suggest things to them, which was a big change in the process compared to before. And that was again, that was because of the, they were noticing how how closely the deadline was coming up. Right, they were happy right. to engage yeah. us as, as, yeah, as full experts on this. Sure, um, yeah. So, I know you've discussed this before in a previous episode, but what were your thoughts on these six? So, yeah, my thoughts on these are uh, 1435 is out right away. Uh, not a big fan of 1154. 944 is interesting, but not something that I want in a flag. Uh, I think when it came down to it, I ended up liking a version of 29, but a version that was, I think, a little bit uh, blue fimbriated between the white and yellow. Um, I think there ended up being a version of that that I liked the most out of these. But I did like, so I, I know what the final four are going to be. Um, and out of the final four, I think I did like 29 and 53 the best. 2100 was interesting because it seemed to be a take on the North Star flag, which we may get like slightly into. Uh, there's at least one listener question on it. Um, but it to me is a lesser version of the North Star flag, so I kind of also discounted it. Um, so I was down in my mind between 53, 1953 and 29. Um, and I honestly came out on the side of 29 to the extent where I bought one from Flags for Good, which to be fair is my show's sponsor, so I get a little bit of a discount. <laughs> but uh <laughs> but uh yeah, I was backing that one. Um even though you know I, I wasn't fully in love with it. Um uh, but I I liked it more than what I was seeing out of 53, I guess. 1953. All right. Well, I, I can tell you what we went through in the design group. Uh, we went through roughly the same sort of process as you did, which was sort of use the method of elimination and take out the most obvious non-contenders. So yeah. 1, 4, 3, 5, that's out. 9, 4, 4, that's out. 1, 1, 5, 4, that's out. Um, and so 29... Uh, we were still against that because of the contrast issues between the white and yeah, yeah. gold. Um, I know that there probably would be, be ways to fix that, but we thought it would be best to focus on the remaining two, 1953 and 2100. Um, and then out of those two, uh, I actually favored 1953 um, for the other one, and Ted favored 2100, and we also noticed that our resemblance to the North Star flag. But then I, then I brought up that specific point that you mentioned before, which is that a lot of new flag designs these days um, have the green, white, and blue color scheme, and they always say, you know, the green is for the land and the blue is for the sky. And they often have some sort of landscape and uh, they have something to fill up the remaining uh, space, which nine times out of 10 is a star. And I said, yeah, we've seen so many flags like that now. Yeah. Um, this is just going to be another one in the crowd. And one of our principles, good flag, bad flag, is to be distinctive. Maybe yes. the first few designs that came out with that sort of idea were distinctive. Nowadays, it's become a cliche. Uh, so we actually advise um, cities to come to us to try and get away from that. Um, because we don't want, you know, we don't want your city flags to be cluttered up by, uh, you, know, people, you know, designs going away from the, typical sail on a beach sheet to now a typical uh, green, white, and blue landscape because they're all going to be like that. And then once I reminded Ted of that, she said, yeah, that's true. I've seen too many of those. 
So he came to the same choice as me, which is one nine five three, and that's what we that's a, that's what we gave to the um, okay gave to the commission. So when, that kind of helped, like nudge that across the the finish line, as it were. Exactly. Yes. You guys coming to an agreement on that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this next slide is just uh, some of the evaluations that we did to come to that decision. Um, right. One thing we noticed was, yeah, some bad contrast in some of those designs. And when you preview these through um, through the eyes of a colorblind person, uh -huh. um, you can see that a lot more clearly, uh, the contrast issues become a lot more extreme. Uh, it becomes, you know, sort of muddy, faded out, grayish. Olive on like some other sort of grayish green, like it's just not distinctive. It doesn't stand out yeah, very well. Yeah. Um, and that's something that they specifically put in the criteria that they wanted us to evaluate. How well would these look to colorblind people? Accessibility was a very major, um, a very major theme of, of their decision making, which was very good. And I mean, uh, if, if you follow the uh, principles of good, you know, good black design, good graphic design. Uh, and you have strong contrast, then your design will look um, very distinctive and legible to everyone. Right. Uh, right. And like then, even in, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then for nine four four, um, I, this is where I brought up the six steel breakers from New Zealand. So I, I yes, really yeah, yeah I was going to say this definitely ties there. right back in. Yeah, because I pointed out like a lot of those design finalist designs that we had. Um, were criticized because people said they look like a logo or they look like a souvenir. And I suggested the way I get around that is, is the art, something called the archive test. So I say, imagine that a flag design, uh, imagine that you're looking at a flag design and someone says, well, this actually wasn't designed right now for the competition. It was actually taken out of an archive from 50 years ago. And the question is, would you believe that? And if the answer is yes, then that means it's a timeless design. It follows, you know, classic mixological principles. It actually looks like a flag. If the answer is no, then that's a sign that it's something that looks you know, too trendy, too too logo like, and it's something that's not going to look good on a flag, and it's something that's going to become dated. And when I when I pointed this out to them, I asked them like, you know, would you believe that if, if this came out of an archive fifty years ago? And then you know, they all had the same answer that they know it it does look like a logo now that you've pointed that out and i said this looks like a, a public pool logo um <laughs> well, what do you think of it yeah uh yeah i could definitely see that it looks like see i i can't unsee what um <clears throat> do you know alan hardy uh i know him yes i know him yeah, well. I, I was gonna say yeah I, I know that you do actually he's on allegedly some of the same committees um but yeah, he pointed out that parts of it look a lot like, I think it's the North Dakota, maybe the South Dakota, like state seal. There is like oh, a yeah. river in the foreground and then there's like a steamboat that has steam coming off of it that looks a bit like that white part uh, with the, the lighter blue part looking like the river. And he was, I think, maybe lightly suggesting, somewhat jokingly, that it looked like somebody, that it was like a psyop, that it was like somebody from North Dakota yeah coming into Minnesota and being like, hey, 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 we'll make their flag basically our state seal. And I can't yeah. unsee that now. Um, before I even saw that or like, you know, was convinced to see that, it did, it just like, it didn't excite me in any way. Uh, and it seems like the goal of this flag is to excite me. Like the movements and things like that seem like that's what it's going for. And it just kind of failed on that count for me. Yeah, it is trying very hard to look very dynamic. But I mean on a on a flagpole the flag's going to wave anyway. Yeah, it's it's doing it's trying to do too much. Especially yeah, as you just mentioned, as it's waving, like it's already got like a lot of implied motion. Uh and then when it's waving, there's even more like actual motion. And it just like it seems like there's too much going on and I'm not a lot gets kind of lost in the nuance and detail uh for me. Yeah. 
uh, before we move on, I'll just um, know one thing I forgot to mention, which is about the color blindness. Um, if you didn't know, uh, there's something, uh, this interesting thing with human vision called, I don't know if I'm even pronouncing this right, Perkinia shift. And when the level of light goes low, especially in the evenings, um, the, the profile of activation in the rods and cones in your eyes actually change. So your color vision um, actually responds differently to different frequencies of light. Um, hmm. And there is, so there are certain colors that you actually see better and some sort of colors that you see uh, not as well and even in conditions. And so that actually distorts your color perception huh. almost similarly to a colorblind person. Um, not specifically like any of these exact right, right, but... um, simulations, um, but it is similar. And it's also, um, um, this is a bit of a side note, it's, it's also the reason why cinema seats are red, because once the lights dim, you lose the ability to see red, but you can see the other colors so that it turns completely dark for you. So this is another reason why we had to preview um, these distorted uh, color perceptions, because even for people without color blindness, um, when you're in evening conditions or low light conditions, you will actually have a distorted, a predictably distorted color perception. And so you need to be able to uh, see the design and have it work very well um, for that sort of condition as well. Huh, that is fascinating. But I can't imagine Minnesota has like really long nights or anything like that that you would need to worry about. <laughs> yeah, All right. it's just eternal summer, right? Yeah, 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 from what I understand. Okay, yeah, uh, awesome. Good to know. Yeah, and so here's here's a yeah, here's a brief summary of our analysis of one nine five three. So once we recommended this is the strongest one, we had to yes. you know talk about um, what are the pros and cons and what we can do to improve it. Um, as Ted K likes to say, uh, fixology processes are not photography competitions. Um, you are not there to select um, an, a flag design exactly as it is submitted and you know, adhere to that exactly, you're here to develop a good flag. So whatever is submitted is usually just the first step or the first draft in what you can and should work on. Um, so the pros of this, uh, the main thing was the unique layout, stylized uh, shape of Minnesota, that's quite unique um, in terms of vexillology. Um, as far as I know, only like swallowtail flags would have that, but like as a standalone design element, like, I haven't actually seen this anywhere else. That's also the reason why I, I, I persuaded him to, you know, choose this one over the other one, because I said the other one, 2100, that's a very generic landscape. Yeah. This one and... has a very Minnesota-specific um, visual identity to it. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to butt in, like, really quick, because we, we did have those, like, questions from viewers, listeners, etc. I think this, I think you're about to answer one, so I'm just going to get the question in, and then you can pretty much say what you were going to say anyway. Um, but Flogmon and uh, Flogmon, uh, Frederick Linbo, who designed the Forest Fens flag, uh, you may know him or of him. Um, but yeah, his question was, why did you end up changing the suggested design? So Frederick, you're in luck. We are about to talk about that or right. currently talking about that. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to go through all those reasons uh, why we made those specific tweaks. I'll also mention that when the commission asked us to look into <laughs> What, when they when they decided to choose six finalists and they asked us to you know decide which one ones are the best and to refine them, they had already decided even before choosing the six finalists that they were going to refine and approve whichever one they chose. Okay, that's good to um, know. I don't think I n was aware of that. But it was of course it was up to us to discuss exactly what. Um, Water I mean, yeah, it makes intuitive sense that they would, but I don't think I was aware that there was like an exact missive to do that uh, specifically. But yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if they ever uh, publicized that particular part of the process, but it was definitely something that they had. Well, we have to. millions of listeners and viewers here, so people will know now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the other pro was the balance layout. Uh, by using the star on the satellite shape of Minnesota in this way, you've got a really strong uh, sense of symmetry. Uh, not perfect, of course, um, which is leads into the next one. Uh, the too many colors and stripes, and this causes issue with uh, contrast, recognition, and focus. So for contrast, um, is mainly the 
you know, the green against the two blues, it's really a bit of a color clash. And when you look at it through a uh, grayscale or color blindness simulation, mm. um, the divisions are not quite as strong, not quite as legible. So um, that the design doesn't work too strongly for that. Uh, recognition, um, you know, when seen from far away, when it's waving, there are lots of different, um, you know, colors and edges that you would have to uh, use as point of recognition to um, yeah, identify yeah. this whole design. Uh, the compete, yeah, the left and right halves compete focus. Uh, the North Star ideally should be the main focus of the flag, uh, seeing as Minnesota is the North Star state. Um, but having too many bright colors in the fly uh, sort of draws your eye too much, like outside to the to the area where you know just not the main focus. Um, they don't really left and right halves don't really mix together. I, I, I was getting a Franken flag sort of feel from this. It almost <laughs> looks like, you know, there are two different flag designs. Yeah. Um, they yeah, sort of get some mashed together. And I guess, yeah, it, it doesn't look like um, they match up perfectly well. I mean, it's not bad because, you know, that they are sort of balanced. They're also symmetrical, the left and right halves, but um, it could be improved. And the last bit is the star is too skinny. Um, I know that this, you know, this is one rendition of the North of the of the North Star, but I, I pointed out, you know, the rendition of the Maple Leaf in Canada is one example. Uh, when you have symbols that are bigger and uh, have a you know more solid interior, then they are more uh, visible, uh, more recognizable from a distance. It takes up more more area. Yeah, and yeah. Of course, there's a symbolic uh, aspect of that as well, because when you, <clears throat> you change the star to the bigger version. That's more in line with the the culturally uh, common stars that you see in a lot of indigenous art, as well as the um, Scandinavian uh, patterns, without specifically re uh, referencing those. And the star right. at the on the floor of the state capitol building. I personally wasn't aware of that particular star at the time, but Lewis was because he was the he was the the chair of the commission. Yeah, so yeah. So <laughs> he, he instantly recognised. Um, he actually had a very uh, rigorous. Um, process in place when we went through these presentations, um, he actually collected um, every single rendition of a star from every submission that had ever, you know, that had that actually collected as part of the Minnesota process. Oh, wow. And there was, yeah, there were literally hundreds. And he wanted the commission and us as designers to, you know, use the same sort of process and, you know, talk about the pros and cons of each one and whistle it down to like, you know, the best um star rendition so that we could use that in the design and we just said look if we had we we had months to do this we we could go through <laughs> hundreds right. of star designs we do not have that time yeah to have, i think at that point we had like one month left um you just have to go with what we're saying in these meetings and what i'm you know mocking up on inkscape right now right. yeah um that yeah i know he was a bit disappointed that we couldn't go through through 100 uh, star designs, but I said, yeah, trust me, we, we can still come up with a good design. You don't need hundreds of stars. Right. Um, uh, oh, this is just yeah. a preview <laughs> of, you know, the contrast issue with the, with the, all the different... Okay, uh, yeah, colors. I was going to ask about the grayscale, so, yeah, okay. Yeah. And the grayscale, it's not quite as strong. And the main thing that we wanted to, I mean, other than the star, it's that profile of the stylized silhouette uh, of Minnesota. That's the main thing that we yeah. need to have the strongest contrast for because that's the most distinctive uh, part of the flag. Right. And as you can see, by including these colors that sort of clash with that edge, um, you're weakening that particular design element, which should be the strongest one. I will also note, uh, turn it sideways, a bit, hanging it vertically on the left, just to show uh, another issue actually two other issues, um, which is that it's kind of, uh, the design is unbalanced, although it's, you know, the layout is roughly symmetrical. If you hang it vertically, it's quite obviously, you know, like lopsided towards the blue end, like the one with the side with the blue, uh, light blue stripe. Um, because the white, the white stripe looks quite empty. Uh, so the symmetry is not quite perfect there. And you can also see, um, I deliberately put it against a white background there the white stripe will blend into a white background. Um, if you're, I always say this, whenever there's a design with a lot of white touching the edge, I'll say, look, 
Uh, not everyone will be generous enough to put it on a darker background or to put an outline around ar around the flag. They will often just shove it onto a white background yeah. exactly <laughs> as is. And you need to make sure that whatever design you have will still look good and still work and still be recognizable on in those conditions because right. you just can't avoid it. And You're in a this pro. Case, You've well, nailed it here, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, not everyone would. <laughs> yeah. In this case, you have an entire third uh, of, of the stripes just disappear. And uh -huh. so it looks like it's just empty. Like there's just, you know, a blue star, I'm sorry, a blue stripe, a dark green stripe, and then just nothing just hanging out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, this is probably, uh, yeah, this is a, that's a problem that occurs really strongly for some flags like, like Russia. I'm sure, you, you know, Russia's been on the news so many times, you've probably seen, like if they have the Russian flag on a white background, just it's just going to look like blue and red. Yeah, blue and red. And I think even Russian people might not even realize that that's their flag until it's pointed out. Um, so I, 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 I yeah, that this is a big thing that I needed to, to show them and show the commission. So otherwise, I wouldn't have um, really seen these specific issues unless you specifically preview them in these conditions and point them out. I think, um, this is a bit of an aside, I think a lot of people who are fans of this original um, design um, you know, had not realized that because they had not thought about all these different conditions that we, we do subject uh, flag designs to yeah, in, yeah. In, in these sort of sort of design sessions or the flag design forum and things like that. There right. are always issues that you don't realize until potentially too late. But uh, by having the vexillologist involved, you can, I can instantly tell you, yeah, that wouldn't work for a colorblind person. That wouldn't work on a white background, things like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's why more vexillologists should be involved in stuff like this. Okay, so, yeah, this was, I think, the slide that I looked the most at when you had uh, sent these over to me, just because I, you know, I like behind-the-scenes stuff like this, so yeah, I, I studied most of these pretty carefully. Um, yeah. yeah, so give us some background on this. Uh, for listeners, these are, as described, some behind-the-scenes shots, uh, and these will also, as always, be in the show notes, so check those out. Well, these are, yeah, not quite behind-the-scenes. Well, stuff. okay. This is, not, this is, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the point where all of our work sort of went back into the public eye. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, in the, okay, so I'll, I'll name the people in this photo. I'll label, I'll, I'll by each of them. So at the top left is Lewis Fitch, who was part of the design team, but also the head of the commission. Mm -hmm. um, on the photograph below, uh, Lindsay Dyer, who was the vice chair. And then on the top right, uh, sitting down behind the laptop, you can see Tyler and Janae, who were also part of the design team. And they were there inside the commission meetings, uh, sort of as ambassadors from our team, presenting our work, presenting our feedback, and guiding the commission. And you can see throughout all the all the photos here, you've got all the different uh, design options that we came up with um, coming out of, of, of our feedback and our analysis of the pros and cons of the final design. So we they had some in paper on the board, which they actually used to vote for the final design. Yeah, I remember um, seeing that. And, yeah. Um, there was quite a substantial gallery to begin with. And they had a whole grid of them, but as they discussed on their way, they were like, uh, right. We started eliminating like entire rows, entire categories that really whistled it down to the final few, which you can see, um, in the top, well, in the top third from the left, yeah, um, yeah. one of where Lindsay's hanging over the, the board, mm -hmm. those, yeah, it was, mm -hmm. that's the point where it's being whittled down to the final few, um, and then. Yeah, and then you can also see they had their laptop out because they were showing some graphics and previews on the screen. Um, but yeah, going back to that photo with Lindsay, um, yeah, those were the final five in that final meeting. I think uh, they removed the two near the bottom, so they were just they just left the the top three. So the one on the left would be the final Minnesota flag. The next one over would be. Um, the one with uh, blue, white, and green. And then the third one was sort of Argentina style, blue, white, blue. And yeah, as you yeah. know, as you've seen, 
as you've seen in the proceedings. Um, you know, that they had they had a lot of discussion. Uh, people, you know, the commissioners were really uh, divided at times, but they all eventually settled. What most of them settled on, uh, the one on the left, which is labeled A two, which is now the final uh, state flag of Minnesota. Yeah. So you, Brian Cham, are you yeah. voting on this part as well, or have you kind of guided it to this part, or helped guide it to this part, and then they in the room exclusively are voting on this? Uh, it's the second thing you said. Okay. Um, I was not a voting member personally. Uh, <clears throat> neither were Tyler and Janae. Uh, Lewis Fitch was the only member of the design team who had uh, voting rights. Okay. Um, even the, in, inside the commission, there were some members who could vote and some who couldn't. Um, that's just a sort of procedural thing that was, um, yeah, and I, I don't have the full context on that. Um, so my job was mainly to help produce those options sure. and to give the feedback and guidance for them to um, to come to the ideally the great great decision about what the final flag should be. Yeah, um, that was that was the job of everyone on the design team, and we all had you know our own thoughts and our own contributions to the different design options. Yeah, um, I. You may know what my next question is going to be, but okay, yeah. if you had had a vote between those three, what would your vote have been? And and feel free not to answer as well, or I can cut the entire thing if you want. No, I'm fine. I'm completely fine answering that question. Okay. Uh, my vote uh, would have been for the flag A2, which is now the official state flag of Minnesota. Okay. So that's why you're fine answering the question. Cause... <laughs> yeah, that's all. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I got you. I got yeah, you. I was perfectly in, in line with that decision. Right. And right. It, it was. I was watching this. Um, I was watching this meeting live, and it was sort of nail biting for me because I was, uh -huh. you know, watching oh, them. I'm you know, sure. Yeah. El eliminate uh, certain flags, and you know, tend towards one flag, but then shift towards the other, and I wasn't sure which way it was going to go. But yeah. It's yeah. Then it eventually settled on um, that flag that I had. Um, recommended as the strongest option uh -huh. and that I would have voted for personally. Right. Um, then I was, oh, I had a very big, uh, very big sigh of relief. I, yeah, I, I think mean, they what did else make can you, this yeah. decision there. And I think that, um, and I, I, I was, and it made me really glad that they did, um, you know, engage with um, the design team because, you know, if it weren't that, then we would have had to go back yeah, you know, one of these, but with minimal uh, modifications. And I think right. that what they chose in the end is much better than any of these by themselves. And right. I, I might have the slide here. Uh, I, th I think oh, we're I... all, yeah, I think we're all happy and lucky that they engaged with a uh, design mm -hmm. team at all instead of letting like a, I don't know, accountant design it like Tampa, Florida did, you know, years and years and years ago. Sure. Although the Tampa flag is iconic. <laughs> it's, uh, it's now well it's, designed. <laughs> yeah, it's it's iconic in all the wrong way. It's just like Pocatello, Idaho was um, black when we did. Yeah, when proud we identified to be. that as the worst flag, yeah, worst flag yeah. in America. Right. Okay. It and uh, I didn't yeah, even thanks. mean to, but I guess I led you right to that this slide here. Yeah. 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 I mean, one reason why I was, you know, very happy with that final outcome is because I, I knew um, sort of what would have happened. If we had not been involved, uh, right. I need to be clear that the commission did not have a specific consensus on this. They didn't really have a consensus on anything. We'll never get a complete consensus. So I can't tell you exactly like what they would have done, you know, if it weren't for the design team and our feedback. But I can tell you a very strong possibility, which was that um, they, in their discussions, uh, without our involvement, they were leaning toward a lot of them were leaning towards if on a four four which is the one we discussed, you know, the one that I called a puppet full logo. Yep, yep. And these were the visual changes that they asked us to make to that flag. They were really insistent on, you know, firstly, you know, the eight-pointed star for the North Star, but also they felt it needed some green. Oh, sure. How are you going to know so where they, the land is if you don't have green? Exactly, yeah. So they, <laughs> they really insisted we add another wave of green. And Unreal. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I won't, you know, again, I can't say, like, definitively, this would have been the flag of Minnesota. If sure, right. The design team had not been involved. Probable there, alternative is a good is, way to yeah, put this it. This is one of the more probable outcomes. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I just need to, I'll just use this one as an example. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, some people, yeah, some people, yeah, some people don't like the final design. I understand no one's going to, no one's going to be perfectly happy with that. And some people, um, you know, have posted comments online. I've seen, you know, was blaming us um, for stepping in and getting involved with the designs. You know, how dare you turn it into this? But I'm like, would you really prefer this, actually? Well, yeah. Well, most of the comments are just stupid. Um, mo- a lot of the comments are... I mean, I don't... There's not, like, a nice way to put it. A lot of the comments are just ignorant people thinking that it's, like close to the flag of Somalia or something or some state yeah. of Somalia, like Quintland or something. I, I forget exactly, but like a lot of it's just from deeply unserious people that don't, it's not really about the flag to them. So you can't really take anything they say too seriously um, to that point, And I won't like linger on the point for too long, but uh, it is kind of fun to lurk in some of their Facebook groups. Uh, and there's a Facebook group that's like Minnesotans against flag change. And I have been in there, you know, pretty much silently for, uh, I guess, some time now. And I'm going to try and bring it up on my phone uh, here, but uh, I can't find it right now. But the gist of it was like, there there are a lot of people that, uh, you know, obviously are against the change. And some lady was against the change and going out to some, I don't know if it was a political rally or a flag rally, like whatever it was. But she was like, Hey, I'm going out to this event and uh, I need the real state flag to take to it. Does anyone have one I can borrow? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so you're that passionate about the old state flag. You hate this new one, regardless of what it's going to be. doesn't matter what the new one looks like. Throw that out. You just hate the fact that it's changed. You love the old one, but you don't own one. So you're going to this event and you have to ask an entire group of people who live around a fairly large state like they don't all live right next to you hey this flag that i'm incredibly passionate about i don't own one do you and it's like okay you guys like i mean for one like they're not to be taken seriously i don't know why i ever even like entertain taking them seriously it's i mostly don't i just kind of like i'm in there for the comedy and stuff like that but um yeah, I don't know. I mean, people are people are going to complain. People would have complained about this one looking like uh, the flag of, you know, they they would have pulled something out of somewhere yeah. and complained that it was well, not X enough or too Y or whatever. Well, I mean, just from a design point of view, I mean, what what do you think of this possibility compared to uh, the one we actually end up? with? Uh, I like the one that you ended up with better, that, that Minnesota ended up with better. I don't, like, it's no secret, like you said, you've watched some of my stuff. You watched the one, uh, the kind of, like, live one I did uh, that's still up um, in its recorded form. I'm not a huge fan of the two blues. I don't know how well they contrast. Out of the t- out of the ones that you had of, like, kind of the final, quote-unquote, final three, yeah, those, I think I tend toward the middle one the most on that. I like how the middle white stripe is the same like uh, height as the star so that it almost looks kind of to me like the star is, I don't know, coming out toward the middle. Well, the light from the star is coming out toward the middle. I can see some problems with it, but I'm not super jazzed on the new design. I have to say Um, it is not. And I guess actually part of where I was leading was I am, uh, I think, in the minority in that opinion, because as i showed you i did do a poll um i I know you had suggested that one poll site but i've got a lot of followers on instagram for the show so i figured as far as like vex minded people i would do the do a poll there and i did pretty much the the new ones like you and i had talked about uh obviously maine is still a proposal but i used the agreed upon you know the 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 one that they're going to vote on the the new tree if you want to call it that but yeah mississippi Utah, Minnesota, and Maine. Um, And I'll give the vote counts for each in order. Mississippi got 13 votes, which was 15%. Maine got 20 votes, good enough for 24%. And then Utah and Minnesota went back and forth at the top the entire time, the entire 24 hours that it ran. 
It ended up Utah got 26 to Minnesota's 25. So good oh. enough for 31 to 30%. But for most of that, almost all of that, Minnesota was consistently one to two votes ahead. Um, another thing to note, there was local pride when applicable. Like all the Utah people I know voted Utah, all the Minnesota people I know voted Minnesota. I think like I'd have to, you know, break down numbers. I think I know a fairly even amount of people from each, if not more from Minnesota. Um, but it was neck and neck the entire way. And it seems to be generally speaking uh, that, yeah, Utah and Minnesota are pretty, pretty neck and neck for that. Yeah, well, that's a very encouraging result because uh, one way of, uh, you know, evalu evaluating the quality of a flag is how, how much uh, the residents um, eagerly adopt the new one. And um, as you can see here, this, this is a slide that Andrew put together. Um, the new design is far more distinctive than the old one. Oh, at yes. a distance, um, and it's hanging as a pen, merchandise, things like that. So, I mean, the, the fact that, um, you know, a lot of your viewers from Minnesota voted <laughs> for the, the new flag. I mean, oh, I, know, yeah. I, I know it sounds a bit biased, but um, actually it, ju it just shows uh, how enthusiastic they are about uh, about the new flag because they if they didn't like it, they could have easily just been disgruntled and uh, picked uh, some other state flag. Yeah, um, yeah, or just not voted. And I will say, like, all the people I know from Minnesota voted. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. people uh, had good engagement on that post, and and yeah, yeah, they they like to a person. Thing, yeah. yeah. And one thing that I have noticed, and this is a bit paradoxical, but a lot of the people who are against the, the new Minnesota flag, um, including you know the a lot of those people you mentioned who said it looked like Somalia, um, are actually not <sighs> Minnesotans. So I I thought that right. there would be some backlash from within the state. People, you know, the people say, "Oh, I like the old flag." Actually. As soon as this guy came into uh, public uh, prominence and he had uh, this particular flag pin, mm -hmm. um, you know, for anyone who, who can't see it, Tim Waltz, you know, the uh, candidate for vice president, then that's when people started um, you know, in a new wave of hate against uh, the new Minnesota state flag. And that's when I saw a lot more social media posts about, you know, the uh, supposed conspiracy about um you know the, the flag of somalia uh, very interesting you know that even, even um even elon musk tweeted about this oh wow shocking there was a uh, uh, shocking but not surprising yeah no. um there was a yeah there was a post on uh twitter or x i don't know what i'm supposed to call in it in this house we um, call it twitter <laughs> there you go in twitter yeah okay on twitter um, there was a post about um, Tim Waltz, like uh, when he became the candidate for vice president. And yeah. There was very, very weird rant about um, how he supposedly, Tim Waltz himself, supposedly uh, changed the flag of his state to the flag of Somalia, and it's got like this. Yeah, they accused him of doing it himself. Um, not supposed to make sense, you know. And then Elon Musk uh, responded to that tweet with um, an emoji, you know, the hmm emoji. Oh, with God, the, that's know, the same the one that... face. Yeah. So it's like, uh, Elon Musk is bought into this. You ought to butt in and be like, first off, I changed it to the flag of Somalia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's tempting. You know, uh, <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, is that actually a journalist from uh, Reuters uh, reached out to me from their fact checking team to ask me uh, whether there was any really? truth behind that, uh, those allegations? Um, they, and they said they were going to publish an article, uh, well, with both with me and Andrew Fricker, um, yeah, you know, refuting all of these claims that have been circulating around, including uh, from Elon Musk. I, I, I can't believe it's really blown up this much. I mean, we didn't get this when Utah changed their flag. Right. Um, it's only, yeah, we didn't get this when Minnesota changed their flag. I mean, that was a very, that was a very heated, very controversial one, probably even more like to begin Mississippi, with. Mississippi, you but mean? Or... Some reason, uh, yeah, sorry, Mississippi. Yeah, Kansas, yeah. I got them fixed up. Um, yeah, Mississippi and Utah never ended up with this level of controversy. Right. But now Minnesota, 
because now it's um, become on a national level. Yeah, uh, yeah. people are coming up with all sorts of. I mean, do you even I heard. do you even bother talking to Reuters? Like, do you, do you like because you at a certain point you're just giving fuel to that? Even like I don't know. I mean, oh, I wouldn't I judge you either was... way, but it's like. It's I thought it was worth very important talking. to yeah. to clarify to yeah. clarify that because um, they have a very wide reach. You see, it's yeah, on, on social media, I wouldn't bother like responding to individuals. Right, like right, only one right. person's going to see that. But I guess that's different. Like having everyone see, like almost from the horse's mouth, from both me and Andrew, say, oh, yeah. the flag of Somalia had nothing to do with it. Tim Walls had nothing to do with it. Uh, we have our own reasons for adopting the color blue. Flag of Somalia is not the only one with the color blue and a star. Things like that. I mean, it, it was almost comical, like when when these designs, the finalist designs, were um, were, were publicized. Even back then, people were coming up with these weird conspiracy theories about the flag of Somalia. People were, um, you know, there's a politician. I don't know how to say her name. Um, I apologize. Ilhan Omar. Is that her name? Wait. Oh, Ilhan Omar. Yeah. Ilhan Omar. Yeah, she's. So she's of uh, Somali descent, and she's a politician, a lawmaker in Minnesota. Yeah. And as soon as these finalists got publicized, she received a lot of hate mail, a lot of hateful messages from people somehow thinking that she had something to do with this new flag and that it had something to do with Somalia. And it was just insane for me. As someone who's been in the design sessions and knows all the symbolism and and has i was i was literally the one who first changed the the fly of the flag to light blue and inkscape yeah like, i was like, <laughs> yeah. mocked out to begin with and seeing all this weird bullshit, um you know yeah, being that's... directed at her and then later to everyone else and from elon musk it is very surreal to me especially because i was the one who made it blue it's like the weirdest case of stolen valor. <laughs> like, like no, actually, no, I did the ad. Ah, fuck it, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. No, that I is... don't want to proclaim my role too too far and widely because I know it's going to start attracting. I just feel kind of sorry for her because I know she had nothing to do with this um, flag right. design at all. Although she did, she did endorse it. She did say she, she likes it more than the previous one, but. Sure. Probably anyone with fixological sense. I was going to say, yeah, one one. anyone with a modicum of like design sense would. It's not even like, even if you ignore like, it, and I know like there is the whole racism angle, but even is- if you ignore that, like it's a slam dunk winner over the old one. Like it, mm. you can't like, I don't know what else to say, but um, I mean, I feel it's self-evident. I mean, this is why Andrew put the these uh, graphics together on the slide um, at a distance you can just instantly recognize it the star the the interface of the two blues um, compared to the old one which is just a complete mess on blue and yeah even from a distance and, we, and the one on the right is from the state capital that he took this on the day that it was first raised yeah um, was invited to that ceremony even from that distance and even when it's against the sky blue background you can still instantly tell uh, which which state flag it is and i and we put that in there also because there are a lot of people saying oh you know oh you've got you've got a, a light blue flag it's going to be invisible on a light blue background but, you know, we can, yeah you can still see it i'll admit um, that was one of my concerns i think i even expressed that on uh on the live video thing so i mean yeah i can i'm not too big to say when i was wrong yeah yeah, yeah i mean hey, it looks to... good it looks good it's a sort of thing that you own that yeah you have you have these um uh, you might have these doubts when you first see it but when you when you actually see it you know in the wild um against the sky then then, then you see it because it's, it's quite a quite a bright quite a vivid blue that we chose um for the fly of this flag i mean of course we did that on purpose both contrast against uh, right. the dark blue as well as to contrast against the sky because the sky Although the sky is light blue, it's typically like a sort of muted, sort of pale kind of light blue. Yeah. It's not going to be like, you know, very vivid kind of blue, which is the one we we chose to be on the fly. Um, No, we did have that in consideration. I know, I I think during the previous panel uh, episode, we had people go, oh, you know, have they even considered um, 
and how it's going to look against the sky. And I, I, I wish I was there because I was like, yeah, we have we have considered it. Yeah, it yeah, makes well, sense that you would have. <laughs> yeah. Given, you know, your, your vocation and everything. Um, Brian, I think we actually need to take a really quick last break. Um, we can come back on some of this after the break. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Anyway, after the break, we will have a couple uh, listener viewer questions for Brian. We will wrap up some of this. We will have time to go into a little bit of maybe some of what you just saw on the screen there um, and just kind of wrap up here with Brian Cham. But uh, yeah, stay tuned. We will be right back. Flag for Content is proud to be sponsored by Flags for Good. Go to flagsforgood.com for more information. 